On June 26th of this year, 2013, the Supreme Court decided a case called Hollingsworth versus Perry. The backdrop to this decision is that uh, the California Supreme Court had upheld same-sex marriage. And then Proposition 8, an initiative that became part of the California Constitution, overturned that state of the law by amending the state constitution to define marriage as a union between a man and a woman. Uh, Same-sex couples then sued to have Proposition 8 de uh, declared unconstitutional as a violation of their due process uh, rights and their rights to equal protection of the law. They sued officials of the state of California, but the court permitted uh, people who had been the official proponents of Proposition 8 to do what's called intervene, uh, to enable them to participate in the litigation, and so that they could argue that Proposition 8 was constitutional. Now, ultimately, the federal trial court ruled for the same-sex couples and against Proposition 8, and it ordered the state officials not to enforce Proposition 8. So the initiative proponents appealed that decision, first to the Federal Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, which embraces California, uh, and then to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, ordinarily, it would be the state of California, through its attorney general, who would take such an appeal. But in this case, the state did not appeal because it actually agreed with the district court's ruling. The proponents of the initiative, of course, vehemently disagreed, and they did file an appeal. Again, it went to the Ninth Circuit uh, and ultimately to the Supreme Court. In the Ninth Circuit, uh, that court posed a question officially to the California Supreme Court asking whether proponents of a ballot initiative have the authority to assert the state's interest in defending an initiative when the public officials uh, refuse to do so. The California Supreme Court answered yes, they did. And in light of that, the Ninth Circuit held that the proponents had, uh, quote, standing to appeal. And it proceeded to reach the merits of the case, that is, the issue whether Proposition 8 was constitutional. And by the way, it affirmed the decision uh, that it was unconstitutional. Now, what is this notion of standing to appeal? And standing, in turn, is interpreted to require that the complaining party have personally and tangibly be injured by what they're complaining about, and that the courts can redress that injury. Uh, when we're talking about standing to appeal, typically a party argues that he's been injured by the lower court's decision, and he seeks redress from a higher court. So the problem in Hollingsworth was that the proponent's only interest in having, uh, was in having the state constitution as amended by Proposition 8, upheld. And that was an interest that they shared with the public at large. It was not personal or peculiar to them. As a result, an injury to that interest did not give them standing to appeal. And the court said that although the proponents had a special position in the process for having an initiative passed, once a proposition is enacted, they had no more interest than anybody else in the validity or defense or enforcement of the proposition, no matter how strongly they felt about it. Moreover, a five-justice majority of the court was unimpressed by the fact that the California Supreme Court had said that the proponents had authority to assert the state's interest in defending the initiative uh, when public officials refused to do so. Uh, the Supreme Court said that, given this pronouncement, the proponents would be entitled to defend Proposition 8 in state court, but that a state court could not decide authoritatively 
the federal issue whether the proponents had standing to appeal in an Article III court. Only the U.S. Supreme Court could do that uh, because this issue is very important to the role of the judiciary in the federal system, which separates the powers of the judiciary from the executive and from the legislature. Now, in the Supreme Court's view, the proponents did not have standing to appeal. The court uh, relied both on the proponents' lack of a concrete individualized interest and on its determination that the proponents were not agents of the people of California. When they intervened, they relied exclusively on their own interests as proponents. They didn't claim to be agents of the state or the people at that point. Moreover, they were not officials. They were not controlled by any principle. Normally, in an agency relationship, the agent is an agent of a principle. Uh, similarly, they owed no fiduciary duties. They could simply argue whatever they wanted without any accountability. Having decided that the proponents did not have standing to appeal, and since the state which would have had standing to appeal, did not in fact do so. The court had to dismiss the case for lack of appellate jurisdiction and not reach the merits. So that's what it did. It also ordered the decision by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals to be vacated or stricken because that court, too, lacked appellate jurisdiction to hear it. That left the district court's opinion standing. It had invalidated Proposition 8, you will recall, and as a result, same-sex marriages have now resumed in California. 